beating to faces. So we looked at it and what does it really mean to be a peripheral in a modern system on chip design? And what can we do to make it more efficient to use? This is a diagram of a, a block diagram of a CAM microcontroller chip. What we have up top on the left is some processor subsystem. It can be a single core, it could be multiple cores. Some internal networking, different buses on different levels. Bus bridges to connect the different networks and possible locations for our CAN controllers. If you look at it, here at CAN 1, it could be on the system bus, which is very unlikely because system bus is a high performance bus. It could be here on a peripheral bus, even further down on another peripheral bus, and yeah, last but not least, as an external device. If you look at the bus performances, of, or the characteristic of the different buses. Here I looked at some FPGA SOC devices. They always, all those devices have an embedded ARM microcontroller subsystem and an FPGA fabric. What we have here is the performance of the processor and then a system bus and the peripheral bus. And we see that the frequency scale down especially for Altera and the Xilinx Sync devices. So the system bus here is half the speed of the processor, the peripheral bus is half the speed of the system bus. And this is the best case scenario. So you can configure the system that, for example, the peripheral bus is only a fourth of the system bus frequency. Okay, so it can be even slower. The micro semi devices are a little bit special but it starts already that their CPU runs much slower than the Altera or the Xilinx device. And there are other characteristics of the buses. So we saw the frequencies, the bus width is different. It could be 64 for the system bus and maybe 16. It's getting unlikely, but sometimes it happens that 16 bit is the peripheral bus. Different protocols have different characteristics. We can have multi-bus, uh, multi-master buses, or single master buses. But it all leads down to a trade-off. It's higher performance, means higher power consumption, means, means higher resource usage. So it's more expensive as well. That's why the peripheral bus, it's uh, lower performance, so lower power consumption, and lower resource usage. Then we have these bus bridges. One thing they do is they separate the networks. So one, what we get is we always have kind of a delay if we go on from one bus to another. And the delays we are talking about is not picoseconds or nanoseconds. Here it's not multiples of clock cycles. Sometimes we have protocol conversions as well where the high-speed bus uses a different protocol to a peripheral bus, for example. And then we can have multi-master buses. This is where we have more than one master accessing the same peripheral device, for example. And one thing that we get there is arbitration delays. So if two masters try to access the same bus or the same peripheral at the same time, we have an arbiter that decides between the two buses. And so if we have continuous tra uh, single transactions, if you like to read the message, uh, receive message data, for example, in the end, we might not end up having back-to-back -back messages because in the middle we have arbitration and the other bus master gets access to the bus. And this means we, the entire access lasts longer. And if we want to avoid this, we have to use burst modes or block modes where we have back-to-back -back cycles. And using burst modes, it's more efficient as, uh, than using single transactions because the burst mode protocol is optimized for higher data transfers. So, what does it mean for us? We, with our small CAN device somewhere at the end. In general, you know, we have a slow access to our device. So, when we design our system, our <coughs> software, as well, we have to look at how often do we access it, or we have to limit how often do we access it, and we have to limit how many cycles we do 
in an excess. <coughs> Excuse me. So one thing that most of us, we can't really do anything about is changing the bus speed, bus speed or the bus architecture. But what we can do is, you know, we can define a peripheral that is, that has a register API that minimizes access cycles, that supports burst modes, and the best, that we can offload the entire data traffic from the CPU to a dedicated DMA engine. This way we have a background task that, translate, uh, that moves the data around while the processor can do something else. So this led to our list of requirements for our next generation CAN core. We already started this before CAN FD came along and so it was kind of great to say, oh, okay, we already have this in the pipeline, so let's look at this and add the CAN FD as well. So we aim to have a efficient and user-friendly register API, support for external DMA engines. And the next point is really important. We have a lot of customers using it in FPGAs, and others are using it in ASIC or ASSPs. And the requirements are slightly different. In ASICs, you, you like to have an implementation that is very flexible, that you can adjust to whatever application needs are. You can't just do an, a new ASIC because some application requirements changed. On the other hand, for an FPGA, there you really like to have just the settings that you need and nothing else. <coughs> and especially some of our customers are using this in satellites and stuff like that. And there, you know, you want to limit the size because the bigger the core, if it, the FPGA is bigger, a bigger FPGA means it's heavier. And there, each gram, you know, it counts. It's expensive to go up there. And last but not least, can FD support. So this shows the block diagram of our upcoming CAN controller. It's a FIFO based structure that uses one common memory. Uh, supports FD, can FD, and so we have two receive FIFOs and a transmit FIFO and a transmit queue. And for the register API, what we have is we have quite one common message object. We have the same layout for the receive and the trans transmit objects. So if you have a route application where you have a device with more than one CAN interface and you route can message it from one port to another. You don't have to do anything. You receive the message, you analyze it, and you know that, okay, this goes to port B, and you just send it over there. And it's an architecture that supports block or, the, or burst modes. And one thing that is quite common is if you have a, if you receive a message, you read the message, and at the end you have to acknowledge the buffer to, that you have read the message. This goes a bit against the block transfer because this means one additional cycle and it's a cycle in the opposite direction that takes more time. So we introduced the auto acknowledge and read feature. So you read a message and the can controller sees that you have read the entire message and the message buffer will be acknowledged. Same story for the transmit where we have an auto send on the right. With the common memory, we have this feature that we, we can implement a very flexible scheme on how many message filters we have, how big a receive FIFO is, how big a transmit FIFO is, and so we can optimize support FPGA implementations where we can select all these as a generics or parameters before the design is created or synthesized. And for ASIC or ASP implementations, it's a bunch of configuration registers that one can set. We have support for DMA. DMA handling is kind of straightforward. It's almost like an interrupt. So whenever the CAN controller sees that, oh, okay, I have data to send or to receive. In this case, I have received enough data to, to send to the processor. It asserts a DMA request, which 
indicates to the D internal DMA engine that, okay, I have data to transmit. So the DMA engine, oops, sorry. Here we go. These buttons are too small. Uh, okay, so the DMA engine receives a DMA request, fetches the data from the CAN core and puts it into the local SRAM, and, or local meaning the internal system memory. And this, uh, once the data is fetched, it, uh, the DMA controller interrupts the processor to indicate, okay, we have new data. And now, the, the processor at its leisure can directly access the memory directly on the system bus, where it knows it's a high-speed bus and we don't have any delays caused by, by bus breaches. Looking at the transmit handle, we have two transmit pipelines. One is a regular transmit FIFO, where messages are sent in the order that you write them into the FIFO. So this is this is where you get uh, no priority inversions. So this means uh, if you have a low priority message and afterwards a high priority message, the low priority message will be sent first. And then we have a transmit queue. Here we load messages and then the CAN controller will send the highest priority message first. And we have a tag memory to keep track of message activity. This is especially imp important and interesting if you have a FIFO and want to abort the message, for example, then you get an idea of which message you have aborted. The receive handler, we have the two receive FIFOs, they're identical, but each one can be individually configured. Or for FPGA implementation, one can be disabled as well. Each message has a timestamp, we support the uh, auto acknowledge on read. And one special feature is the hardware trickle. Whenever we have a receive, received a message that matches the filter zero, the message filter zero, we get this hardware interrupt. This, interest, this is interesting if you, hang, if you, for example, use a sync message to synchronize your entire system. You can trigger either directly an interrupt or you can trigger a hardware timer on that. And so your entire system is really has a good information on where we are in this sync time frame. <coughs> okay, so next is design verification. We developed two different test benches. One is a CAN conformance test bench, and the other one is a system level test bench. And simulation is one thing, but hardware verification is is, uh, is important as well. Looking at the block diagram for the uh, can conform test bench, <coughs> so we have several stimuli generators that control the entire behavior of the system. And what we use is uh, an approach called transaction based verification. TBV, where we have several models. Here we have a CAN bus function model, a CAN logger, or here a transceiver function model. Each of these blocks have a, a command interface that we can call from the stimuli generator. So we can, from the stimuli generator, for example, call put message with the content for the CAN message, and this will be loaded or sent to the CAN BFM, and the CAN BFM will translate this into the low-level uh, signal RX and TX, or TX signals, in, in this case, going up and down with the frequency and the content that we have programmed. So this means on the stimuli generator, it's really a, a high-level approach that we have. Even non-hardware engineers can look at the code and understand what's going on. For the conformance test bench, we have a local DUT handler that interfaces with the register port of the DUT. And this one decodes messages coming from the CAN bus and executes the commands from there. 
the system level test bench is here we go is very similar the on a part of having different stimuli generators we have a local bus bus function model here so either APB or AXI bus function models that is used to control the registers inside the DOT. And so the system level test bench is, is there to verify that the entire functionality of the core is correct. So from the, from the system perspective and not from the low level CAN perspective. For the hardware ver verification, we developed this FPGA test vehicle. It is based on a Cortex M3 FPGA, where we have an entire microcontroller subsystem with all regular functionality. We have memories, we have UART timers, interrupt controllers, and then we have a peripheral bus bridge, where we have an APB bus bridge and the our DOT, our CAN controller, inside the FPGA fabric. Here we have support for interrupts, obviously, and the peripheral DMA controller that's inside. So this one is used in our hardware test setup. Here is a short image how it looks like in our lab. I cleaned it up a bit for the, to make this picture, and uh, I even forgot to connect one cable. <laughs> so the block diagram I showed you is this FPGA here, this board, that has a single CAN module inside. We have a second one here where we have a dual CAN channel, and this is here where I only connected one, and not two. Um, then we have the, the vector USB adapter with the with two Bosch M can reference models in there. And with this, we, we verify that our core works with the Bosch implementation together. So here we go. So as, as we have seen, low, can is a low speed peripheral, but this doesn't mean that it's, it has to be low speed. We can do things to in, increase the performance by using burst transfers by using DMA engines. All modern SOC devices, all modern microcontrollers out there, they have DMA engines inside. So it's good that we take advantage of that. Uh, I, sh I showed a short overview of our fiber-based CAN controller and showed you how we verified it in simulation and in hardware. Thank you.